Hey guys, back here with another video. This time I'm going to talk about the new Nikon, or my, new to me, Nikon D500, which is a Nikon's, I guess, their high-end APS-C size sensor, DSLR. And I got this primarily for the 4K video and the touchscreen, which I'll go over in a second. So basically, just the quick highlights of the camera itself. It uses 153 focus points with a 180K pixel RGB metering sensor, so basically that helps with the focus tracking and all that fun stuff. It has a 2.1 million dot tilting LCD screen, but unfortunately you can't use it for menu selections and I don't know why that's the case. I know that the D5500 can do it. Maybe they're just rushing at the market or who knows, maybe hopefully in a firmware update they'll address that. Um, basically, you have phase detect in the viewfinder with all the fancy focus points, but not available in live view, which uses contrast detect, unfortunately. And that's pretty much in movie mode. So if you're going to be shooting movies or using live view, you're stuck with the uh, old school contrast detect. It does use the SnapBridge software, which connects your, your smartphone to your camera and allows you to transfer JPEG images. And The cool part about that is you can also tag your images with GPS location information and sync the uh, camera clock with your smartphone. So that's kind of cool. Uh, the interface is a little clunky on the SnapBridge and it has a very rudimentary basic you know, shutter release. I don't think you can do, uh, you know, adjust shutter or aperture and all that fun stuff, but hopefully they'll address that in the future firmware. So the movie highlights, which you know, the reason why I got it for, does have, you know, does shoot in 4K and here's some of the quick specs on that. So 4K shoots 4K in Ultra HD at with a 2.25 crop, and that kind of sucks, but I guess that's what we got to work with. So it just crops into this. I mean, this is already a 1.5 crop because it is a APS-C. Canon uses a 1.6 crop, so Nikon uses a slightly larger sensor in their APS-C, therefore it's only a 1.5 crop. So it's cropping in already, so my 24 to 70, it's not a real 24 to 70, but you know, that's all right, I guess. 4K crops down to 2.25. The and I have you know sample videos if you look at my other videos of the um, different you know crop factor shown in real time while shooting in 4K. So it does have you know full HD as well, but the 4K it shoots in 34, I mean 3840 by 2160, and it shoots at 30, 25, and 20, 24p, and it records it at one you know 1. I don't know, 144 megabits per second. So that's pretty impressive, and then in 1080. 1080, which is full HD, shoots in 1920 by 1080 at 60 and 50p, and that records it at 48 to 24 megabits per second. And then it also shoots 30p, 25, and 24, which drops the bitrate down to 24 bit megabits or 12, depending on the quality. And then, of course, it shoots the standard HD, the 720, which is the 1280 by 720 at 60 and 50p at 24 and 12 megabits per second. Shoots an MPEG 4H.264 codec. You can record up to 29 minutes and 59 seconds of video. And what that does is each movie is recorded across up to eight files at four gigs each on your card. So it's not one continuous file. They're like little chunks of little video clips. So you'll have to assemble them in, uh, in a video editing program. Not a big deal, I guess. That's probably the way they're able to deal with that bunch of si you know file sizes. The uh, It does have an anti-flicker option between 50 and 60 hertz, and that basically minimizes or gets rid of the flickering from some uh, light sources like some of the uh, um, um, as a mercury vapor or sodium sodium lamps. Um, it does have electronic vibration reduction available in 1080 only, so basically it's digital, you know, sensor-based image stabilization. I never use those because what it does it actually crops in a little more already on your crop image to use the extra pixels to stabilize your, your image. I guess, you know, in a tight pinch, and if you're not using post-processing, that might not be a bad way to go. So basically the autofocus, the contrast detect autofocus, which is, you know, available in live view, it's prone to rapid and drastic attempts to refocus, and it's like, G -g 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 -g. it's kind of jittery. It's not smooth like Canon's 80D, I believe, that has a uh, pixel shift, which is really smooth and nice. I wish they had that on the Nikon. The the 4K uncompressed file can uh, be outputted to 8-bit at 422 out from HDMI. 
Uh, let's see what else. So yeah, I mentioned the 4K's 2.25 crap, which cuts into the camera's low light capabilities. You end up using an area of the sensor slightly smaller than a micro four thirds. So there's a low light panel to be paid. So it's, yeah, as it crops in, it kind of stinks in that way. The photos, oh yeah, you can take photos during movies. You know, just, you have to set it up in a custom function, but you just press the shutter button and it will take a photo, but it also stopped the movie and that's kind of annoying. And, and then the photo saved as a you know high quality fine JPEG, and you can set that on you know under the custom setting G1, custom control sound and shutter release button. The movies are recorded in an sRGB color space. Uh, there's no focus peaking option to help man, you know judge manual focus. Nor is it possible to magnify a live view while you're shooting movies. I'm sure or hopefully they can address that in a, for more upgrade. There's a highlight warning system to help you judge exposure, but no zebras, I guess. There's power aperture, which is really cool, and I demonstrated that in my other video in real time. Basically, what that does is instead of using, using the click, you can hear the clicking sound, you can assign the function buttons on the front to open and close the aperture. You know, it's more like a gradual rather than a hard step, and it's a little bit quieter, but you can kind of hear the button pressed recorded in the recording on onboard mics. So if you use an external mic, which you should be using, I guess, if you're using DSLR video. The, um, the oh, there is auto ISO too to maintain image brightness when shooting in manual exposure mode. And can use, can use exposure compensation to adjust the exposure, which is kind of cool. That's cool. I mean, at least Nikons are, you know, starting to allow you know, aperture control during filming. They didn't do that for a long time. You know, there's only a handful of Nikon cameras that can do that. Whereas Canon's been able to do that all along. Although Canon's moved on to their professional line of, you know, movie-making equipment, and they're kind of leaving their DSLRs where they are. Uh, it also shoots in a flat picture profile, but it's not nearly as flat as the log gamma curves offered by Sony or Canon. So, you know, for post-process color grading, hopefully Nikon will address that. There is an option of wired or wireless uh, control you can get for it, which will which can uh, start live view and movie recording. It does have stereo mics, mono speaker with both quarter inch mic and headphone ports. That's pretty cool. And it is a weather sealed body that uses the same batteries as many of the other Nikon DSLRs in the lineup. So yeah, it's, that's pretty much that. I'm uh, just rattling out the specs for now. And then you can see the very, and it does, you know, it does have the 10 frames per second. That's the big, big, you know, let's see if I can try that out. Yeah, it's pretty much like a machine gun. It does, uh, you know, eat up your memory card. It does use the XQD cards, uh, and it also has a compact flash. So you have, you know, the option of one or the other right on the side here. And, of course, the star of the show is the tilting screen tilts up. Let's see if I can show you. So we've got a little hinge system there. So you can tilt it straight up so if you're looking down. Or I think, yeah, and you can tilt it all the way down like so, so if you're looking, shooting over a crowd. So that's pretty cool. Touch screen is pretty neat. I'll demonstrate that in a second here. And just to give you a size comparison to the full frame D810. Let me reach over there. I have an 80 to 200 attached. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I have an 80 to 200 attached to it, so it looks also looks much larger. Body's chunkier. You know what's weird about it is they move the ISO and the exposure compensation button on here. So they <laughs> moved it from here and here to there and there. I don't know. The uh, screen resolution is much sharper. I mean, it's not hugely noticeable on the uh, D500 from the D810, but it, you know, it is a... I mean, it's definitely not retinal display by any means, you know, but it's not bad either. 
both cameras showing up the 70 to 200 28 and the 70 to I'm sorry 70 to 200 28 and the 4, 24 to 70 to 8 original version they have a second version of both these two now that have come out this is a VR2 I believe they have a let's say VR3 or something like that so that's the size comparisons overall between the two bodies here I mean they're both I mean the D500 is still pretty chunky. I think it's chunkier than the D610 even. So there you have it. So yeah, if you want that, that 10 frames per second on the D500, you definitely have to use the like XQD cards. You know, like, like I said, most of the uh, features on the cameras, I'll demonstrate maybe individually. I just want to go over the quick specs on the guy. Kind of give you a general size comparison between that and the full frame D800. But yeah, I mean, it's a fairly nice camera. I mean, I do, I do like crop sensor uh, cameras for the fact that you're getting a lighter package and you're getting the extra focal length reach not I mean I shouldn't call it focal length that's a little misleading you're getting the field of view crop um, and I'll demonstrate that as well you're not getting the wide as you would on a uh, full frame one of my most popular videos I did was the crop versus full frame and I think I may update that video and show various samples and the thing I didn't talk about last time was not only does the, the field of view change the focal length doesn't change, so the distance between near and far doesn't change. But, you know, it's basically it's like taking an 8x10 photo and taking a pair of scissors and cutting it to a 5x7, and that'll give you an idea what the crop, actually cropping does. But it also affects uh, light gathering, the aperture, too. You know, in terms of the bokeh, of course, but, you know, in order to get that equivalent, I guess, you know, there's other calculation to be involved, but you'd have to stop down the full frame camera more to get the same equivalent depth of field in terms of near and far sharpness and I'll demonstrate that for another video but that's pretty much it guys the uh, D500 Nikon's uh, first 4k camera and it's the long-awaited update to the Nikon D300s all right guys thanks for watching and I'll have some future videos on this camera if I see interest in it if not you know, I don't know we'll see all right thanks guys